Good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer to invite me here and give me the opportunity to talk about uh, this topic to, to which I devote a lot of uh, time and, uh, during my studies. So, this is a joint work with Raffaella Burioni, Pierluigi Contucci, Cecilia Verna and Alessandro Vezzani. Actually, uh, Raffaella should go give this talk, but then uh, at the last moment she couldn't join us. And uh, so, let's go on. We use for this work a data set from the regional health system of the district of Parma in uh, Italy, and uh, thankful to the Dr. Luigi Lombardossi. The outline of my topics is the following. I will start uh, talking about the role of interaction in social sciences, then I'm going to focus on our um, phenomenon, that is the participation in a screening campaign. I will describe the model that we use to, um, to codify their choices, and then I'm going on with the, the um, procedure to estimate the parameter from the addition data, and starting from the uh, value that we obtain, to, uh, to try to to define some strategies to, to enhance the participation. And I will conclude with some future research perspective. So, let's start saying that every day in our life, from the very moment we wake up till the last one before to fall asleep, we make choice. Yes, we can start thinking if uh, we want to have tea or coffee, if we want to go to the bar or stay at home, to have breakfast, and then in which way we can uh, reach our work, workplace, and so on, to go to the university or not. We are, we are taking choices always, I can say. But actually, uh, the way in which we uh, can take this choice is not always the same. We can say that in some cases we can choose alone. We can wait uh, all the different uh, options and then select the best for us. In this case, as we, we are following our individual inclination for that specific uh, question. And if now we consider not only one agent, but a big number and agent facing the same question, if they are shooting in isolation, we can consider them as independent agents. Conversely, there are different types of choice in which we are not able to understand alone what is the best option for us. Cecilia, last, uh, some days ago, talked about uh, health insurance. Actually, the cost to uh, read all the different policy and then select the best one is too high for somebody that is not so inside the, the, the problem, that is not from uh, a company, an insurance company. So in this case, the best thing to do is ask to somebody that we trust and that may be had to, mm, to choose the same thing and uh, so we can imitate, we can interact with other people. Okay, the aim in general uh, with uh, all the people that work with the application in uh, social science is to define a model that is able to start from uh, an individual choice mechanism, so from, from a micro uh, problem, and then lead us to understand and to describe and also forecast the collective behavior, so a macro phenomena. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, in the first cases, so when the, in, the agents can be considered independent, there is a famous theory in economics called discrete choice theory that is able to uh, provide a very good uh, forecast. So let's see briefly how discrete choice theory works. So let's suppose to have an independent agent that can choose among a finite number of options. Each agent is assumed to make this is our choice in order to maximize this function. This function is an utility function and is composed by two terms, one deterministic and one uh, randomic. So it is a kind of uh, improvement of the classical rational mm, choice theory, people that work with uh, 
political sense, then I think you know the, this theory because it was used uh, to understand the type of option between um, candidates. So here, the, the random term account for situation in which even if we think that maybe the best uh, option for us to reach the workstation is by using the bus, in one sunny place we can, you know, select to go by the bicycle. Okay, so uh, now if the um, random term are all random variables with, with a gamble distribution, and in this case the model is called logit, we have this expression for the probability to make the choice sigma high that then lead to this uh, other expression for the joint probability. Um, well, actually, um, there is not a rigorous foundation to select uh, this specific type of uh, um, distribution. Uh, they tried a lot of different ones. For example, you can select uh, um, Gaussian distribution for the third, but in that case, your model is not, cannot be solved in exa exactly, and so it's really difficult to use that model to make prediction. So this is not a rigorous foundation, but uh, it works very well when the, uh, the situation, the phenomenon we are analyzing, can be considered really without the role of interaction. Okay, let's now see what is or what can be the relation of discrete choice theory with statistical mechanics. Okay, so let's consider the simplest um, case in which our agents are facing a, uh, oh, here we have, I miss an S, uh, yes, no choice. So we have that, uh, we, uh, we label this choice with uh, this binary variable that takes the value the value is 1 if the agent says yes, otherwise the value is minus 1. And we use this linear form for the deterministic part of the utility. And we conserve the gamble distribution for the random term. In this case, we have the following expression <coughs> for the uh, probability, the joint probability, that you can see is the Boltzmann Gibbs distribution relate to this Hamiltonian, non-interacting Hamiltonian. Actually, this is not a rigorous uh, foundation for the use of uh, statistical mechanics in the, in the social science. Well, in fact, well, as a mathematician, as if now I, I would like to, to add interaction, the idea could be, OK, I can add an interacting term inside my Hamiltonian. Well, I can give you a second uh, foundation for the use of this, uh, of this approach that we can obtain in a completely different way. So, so far we start by considering what is the choice mechanism and then we create the distribution, the bottling distribution and, and an Hamiltonian. Uh, the Hamiltonian can be considered as a cost function, a global cost function. Well, if now instead we start from um, the data that we have and we measure some average of the state, then we can, we can look for the uh, distribution that fit, the best fit uh, for our data with the la least number of assumptions. And uh, mm, this one, uh, now here we need to make another assumption because uh, if we use the Shannon entropy to measure how, how random is our distribution, well, now uh, solving the maximization of the entropy starting from this average, we arrive at the same distribution that we have here. Okay, so. Before to go on, I want to add also that actually very often from the data it's not possible to measure all the age high for all the agents. So the strategy is to divide people in meaningful group and then assume that this value, the value of this parameter is equal for all the agents that belong to the same to a same group. Okay, so with this <coughs> With this limitation in mind, but also with this uh, uh, link between 
um, discrete choice and statistical mechanics. Now, when in the case where interaction cannot be uh, avoided, when interaction is relevant, we, we want to try to use this Hamiltonian. And actually, we use this Hamiltonian for the case of the partic participation in the um, screening campaign. Actually, we were not the first that tried this, uh, this way. Around 2000, um, <coughs> Broken Door Love had this term here. But then they consider only the simplest case. So they consider that all the coupling were equal to the same value and also all the individual inclination were, were equal to, us, uh, to a one unique uh, value. But in this way, they add interaction, but they lost the very important key of the discrete choice, that is the meaningful subdivision in groups. Because as uh, we, we listened before, the, before lunch, actually, we are not so simple as atoms. We have some features that cannot be uh, avoided when we are looking to specific choice. Uh, OK, so actually, the model that we are going to use was developed by uh, Ghirlanda and Contucci in 2007, and is a model where you again add this term, but you have the subdivision in groups. OK, now let's go to a brief description of a screening campaign. The goal is to, is to detect anticipatory signs of serious illness in order to prevent them or deal with them in a non later stage. <coughs> in order that our campaign is efficient, we need to have a night coverage of the target population, a wide adhesion, and also a fair particip participation of all the different social groups involved in the campaign. In the UHA, we have different types of campaigns, among them, for example, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, colon cancer screening. In this work, we focus on this one, cervical cancer screening. And this one are the specific recommendation, Ooh, sorry, in the case, in the specific case of this campaign, the test to detect, to detect the cancer processes in women is called Papa Nicolaou's mirror test. I'm going to call it only simply pap test. Okay, as we can see, the campaign involved women between 25 and 64 years old, and they are screened every three years. Here we have the pap test is free, and is free in order to, um, to involve people and women with a different income to avoid this problem. And uh, then the indication is to reach a very high percentage of the target population. The attendance has to be <coughs> at least 60%. And then, of course, as I said before, we need this fair participation of women. Yeah. This person in reaching a percentage of the target population in attendance. Okay. The difference is that <coughs> reach the population means send an invitation to the 98% of women. The decision is the, the women that decide actually to, to take targeted. the test. The target depends on not what you have in the day. Yes. OK, uh, obviously, these indications are for Italy, even if they follow the, Euro the European guidelines. The, um, the indications are different for different countries, because uh, women are not the same all over in the world. For example, in North Europe, they are facing the problem to uh, move the attendance from the 80% to around 100%. In Italy, the situation is completely different, so this one can be good. <laughs> OK, so now let's talk about the choice for a woman to participate or not. We can see that 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> this choice can be influenced by the individual inclination toward the invitation. I mean, I received this letter, I, I, can dis uh, I can think immediately, oh, I received something from uh, a doctor, I can go. This is without influence from other people. But actually, in this type of choice, can be important also a peer-to-peer -peer effect arising from the interaction with the other women involved in the campaign. So, in the first case, we can have the, some women that are really aware of the importance uh, of the test. Maybe because they are informed, or maybe because uh, some other women in their, in, in their family have some problem of illness of this kind. And, of course, that women will participate. On contrary, there are women that are not properly informed, or maybe they think that the test is not so important. In that case, if you think that it's not important, why to go? It, it's a cost to, to go to the, to, the, to the hospital to take a test, from the time point of view and also from the monetary point of view. But the most part of women do not have a strong personal opinion about the test. So maybe they are going to receive this uh, invitation and they are going to, to be influenced by the opinion and advice of friends, other women in the, in the family, and to ask, uh, oh, do you think this is important that I go or I can stay at home? It's not so relevant. <coughs> OK. Our data set is, as I've mentioned before, from the regional health system in the district of Parma. The period that we analyze is from 2004 to 2012. All the municipalities of the district are, include, are involved in the, in the campaign. The data set is really huge. There are the answer and <coughs> So, the question and answer. And uh, this number corresponds to this number of distinct women. Okay? The data set is anonymous with information about age, place of residence, and the date in which the invitation was sent, the date in which the, um, the test was planned, and also if the, 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 women, the woman decided to participate, carried out. Okay, so for who is not so, um, don't know how a campaign of this type work, I'm describing here the typical routine. So once a month, there is a, a program that selects a set of women from those, um, in a random way, from those that received an, an invitation more than three years ago. And uh, in this way, a number that can go from 1,500 to 5,000 women is invited each month. The invitation is made by a letter, and then if the, if the woman does not uh, respond, she will receive a reminder letter after two or three months. Uh, as we can see here, the letter contain, contain a proposed date, but actually, then, um, this, this date is not mandatory. A, a woman can call and decide with, uh, <coughs> with the health, uh, with the doctor, the date that her prefer com, uh, according to her schedule or also her period. And then, the target population has to be reached in three years. The period of three years is called round. So, since we go from 2004 to 2012, we analyzed three complete rounds. Okay, so first of all, we analyze this data and we consider the mean adhesion to the first invitation. In our analysis, we consider first invitation only and not the second one um, for all the age of the target population. Here we can see that <coughs> the attendance, the adhesion, grow with age, and in particular we have uh, a first group with, in, in which the adhesion is really very low, far from the 60% of attendance 
requested from the European GAD line. Then here we have a stable sector and then it starts to grow a little bit more for the old ladies. Okay, we can also, you know, look, uh, see these two uh, separators between classes and interestingly we can see that actually they represent significant age in the life of a, of a woman. Instead, in fact, 39 is uh, the age at which at, uh, the 90% of women at at least one child and this is actually I think I cannot uh, really say this because uh, I have no child <laughs> but in any case I think that it represents really a, a change in the life of a woman and then 52 is the average age of menopause. So then we consider these three relevant classes and consider the percentage of evasion month by month. Or here maybe is a little bit small, this picture, but we can see that the statistical, the fluctuation that we have month by month are not statistical, cannot be produced by <coughs> independent variable. And so we expect peer-to-peer -peer effect among women. Okay, so Let's define our approach to the problem. We codify the choice to <coughs> participate with the variable sigma hi. And then, since as I, as I mentioned before, this choice is, is related both to the individual attitude that I'm going to denote with age i and with the interaction with the other women, we want to consider this form for the cost function. <coughs> also here, we have the problem that our data set does not allow to measure all the JJ and all the age high. In fact, even if the data set is really huge, <coughs> each woman uh, has been invited in, the, in this period at most three times. <coughs> and so we cannot measure exactly this. But we can use our data analysis to divide women in meaningful groups. In particular, we decide to divide them in these three groups and to use this form for the cost function. Here, for example, it means that <coughs> if we have a woman of 29 years old, she has an individual inclination toward the test equal to the value of the parameter H1 and <coughs> interact with the other women in different ways depending on the group they belong to. So the strength of interaction with another woman of the same sector as this one and instead the, the interaction with the middle woman is this, and with the oldest one, this one. Okay, I want to, to add that if the interaction among people from different groups is equal to zero, this model becomes, <coughs> this Hamiltonian becomes the Hamiltonian of three separate Curie-Weiss models. Okay, since actually the interaction is the, is the same, depends only to, to the groups, we can introduce the average choice within each group and rewrite the cost function in this way. Okay, so to know the probability to participate in the, in the test, we need to determine this matrix and this vector. Before to describe the procedure, the inverse procedure to do that, I want to add that the key point to, to resolve the inverse problem is that this model can be solved exactly. Instead, the pressure for particle of the, uh, of the model can be obtained as the supremum of this function. 
from which we obtain the system of mean field equation that describe the model in the limit. OK, so <coughs> let's start with a general description of the inverse problem. So let us consider a specific Hamiltonian and the corresponding distrib Boltzmann Gibbs distribution. Now, when we are facing a direct problem, we fix the value of the parameter in our Hamiltonian, and then we compute, we want to compute the average value of the spin, in our case, the magnetization, because we know that is the important observable of the model, in the thermodynamic limit. And after we do that, we can generate equilibrium configuration. On the contrary, when we want to solve an inverse model, we start from data that we consider as equilibrium distribution. And then from this, uh, from this data, we <coughs> estimate the average, this average macroscopic quantities in the limit. And then from the, uh, we, we need to find an expression of the parameters as function of these macroscopic quantities. OK, I will show now, firstly, this arrow and then the previous one. OK, actually, um, the inverse problem can be solved when the system that I show you before has a unique uh, stable solution. Well, when there are more, uh, it's also possible, but everything has to be uh, considered with care. So we know that in that case, the average value of the magnetization of each group in the limit is equal to 1, the corresponding element of the solution of the mild field equation. So we can differentiate with respect to the individual inclination, OK, and to obtain this. This, in analogy with statistical mechanic framework, we can call the elements of the susceptibility matrix. OK, so if we look on this side of the identity, we can compute that uh, this derivative is equal to ns, so the cardinality of uh, the group S that multiplies the covariance <coughs> of the magnetization of the group L and S involved. And this means that actually we can compute the element of the susceptibility matrix in this way from the average from the correlation, the, the covariance in the, in the limit. On the other side, here, we have this expression that we can use a full write in a matrix form. OK, let's, let's say now that the element of key are computed, as I showed you before. And also here, this term mu1 square and the other two can be computed from the <coughs> average uh, magnetization in the limit. It was the starting point, the, the first identities in the previous slide. OK, so now we can invert that identity and obtain our parameters. Once we compute the interacting parameter, <coughs> we can also find the individual inclination by inverting the mean field equation. OK, so now we have an expression for the coupling and also for the individual inclination in terms of macroscopic quantities in the limit. Now we need to estimate these quantities from our sample, from our data. So we use the maximum likelihood estimation. We need to have a sample of independent spin configuration. And then we consider the maximum likelihood function that reaches maximum when <coughs> the average magnetization and the correlation are estimated from data in this way. In our specific case, we consider as a single uh, configuration of uh, answer the set of answers of the women invited in the same month. In this way, we obtain a 
sample of 105 configuration. I, I want to add that actually, as we, we've seen before, the number of women invited each month is not always the same, C can, can vary a lot. And so uh, N is not fixed our in, in our case. So I want to write here before to give you the result of the, <coughs> of the inverse problem. The, the value that we use, this is simply the average of the number of women inside the, within the two group that are invited. Okay, so this is our answer. This is, these are the values that we obtain applying the inverse procedure. We can say that the individual attitude that was at the beginning for the first group negative, so we have that the first group has an inclination not in, in the sense of not going, and then it grows. Actually, here is not growing, is decreasing. But uh, at the, with, the, with the separation of the age of 39, it changed time, and it means that after that age, <coughs> your inclination is in the sense of going. Okay, what we can say instead with relation to the coupling, here we have height value on the principal diagonals, and this means that there is a coherence inside within each group. And instead, the value of, of the interaction, of the intra-group interaction are really lower, but it can arise from this uh, value that there is a pivotal group, the group G2, that is well connected to the other two groups of women. So now, uh, we have this value, we want to try to to make something, to define uh, a strategy in order to enhance the participation. Actually, we have two goals. We want to enhance the participation of the youngest girl, the group G1, and also to enhance the global participation of women. Okay, so the standard action to do that are, for example, the invitation with a letter. I want to mention that before the the presence of a campaign, <coughs> the, the, uh, the PAP test was, uh, was done only after a suggestion of the general practitioner, and the, the participation was really, really low, around 18%. So actually, the invitation, the letter, was um, an incentive that worked. So, and then also we can have advertising on media or education and answerance program, actually, the fact is, in all these cases, the awful result is to increase the individual inclination, that is to increase the parameters, the value of the parameter HL. This can be a good idea, but as a, an high cost, the cost depends to the number of uh, women that we, are, uh, that we want to reach with this uh, action, and uh, the unique cost can be parameterized in this way. So, if we want to uh, rise <coughs> the participation of the group G1, we could, for example, invest a cost only toward this group. Okay, before to compare these standard uh, strategies with uh, a new one that we considered, I want to show you the power of interaction. So, here I'm considering a very standard action. I'm going to invest this cost over the group that participate, that, that has a low, a low participation. Okay, if the, the system of women would be without interaction, we, the fact is not really so relevant. We can see here that this horizontal line is the, uh, the, the value of the magnetization uh, obtaining from the data. And so this is the starting point, the, the one that we, we resolve with the inverse problem. And then we vary 
H1 and we obtain this really small increment. Instead, when the women are interacting with each other, with investing the same cost, we can obtain far better results. In order, you know, moreover, it's really very important to, to observe that we have a drug effect on the other two groups. So, since we have seen from our data analysis that there is interaction among women, so we are in this situation, we want to exploit the, the interaction. So, we decide to compare three different strategies. The first one is the classical one. I invest my cost on the <coughs> group with the lowest participation. The second, the second one is always is again uh, classical, but I want to try to um, use the interaction in the sense instead to act on the group G1, that is the biggest one, so imagine to multiply the cost for all the uh, people inside that group, I want to invest on the group G2, that is really, I don't know if you remember from here, okay, look, this is the biggest one, so if we invest on the second one, the cost has to be smaller. Okay, so let's go back there. And then we have a third strategy in which we continue to invest on the pivotal group, but we also increase the strength of the interaction of this group with the other two. And here we assume that uh, to make this has no cost. Actually, I, I don't know if this is really possible, but even if as a cost, this has to be really smaller and smaller with respect to a strategy of the first type. Okay, so here is, this, is the result. This is for the first strategy. It's the same plot I showed you before. And here is for the second and the third. We can see here that actually the second is able to enhance the participation of uh, um, the group G1, but the result is not enough, actually. Instead, in the third case, where we also work on the interaction, the results are really very good. We raise the, <coughs> we raise the, the participation of the group G1, and the global participation reach the 65%. Okay, we consider also a second analysis. So now we, we decide to consider in the cost to arrive to the 60% participation, the one recommended from the European guidelines. Here we can see that the unique cost of the first two strategy is very similar. I remember that this has to be multiplied for a number smaller than this. But the cost of the third is really low compared to the previous two. And so again, also with this uh, plot, with this picture, we can, we can say that the third strategy is the best to enhance the participation in our case. Of course, we consider here only some possible strategies we, we, can, we can think to, to do something also different. You, you can change every, every combination of parameters here. Maybe also more than uh, one and two to, and see what's, uh, what is possible to obtain. And this is possible, of course, because the model can be solved in, a, in an exact way. Okay, in conclusion, so what are the future, future research perspective? First of all, we want to provide efficient policies to enhance the participation, and this could be done with um, a joint work with people that work in the screening campaign to understand really also from, from them what, what can be done to, to increase the interaction. And then apply the model to different screening data sets to test its robustness and 
improve the division in class. In our, from our data, we could only consider two different uh, attributes, age and place of residence. Uh, place of residence in our study was not relevant and we found that age instead it was. But maybe other different data sets can contain other attributes like uh, um, the level of instruction of women, their monthly salary or, and so on. And eventually something that is completely different from screening campaign. So try to describe and forecast with this model different phenomena where interaction play a very important role. Okay. Thanks for your attention. sociological point of view, this is correct. It can be that the, the interaction is not symmetric. But in this case, from the data, it's not possible to measure this kind of difference. And moreover, from the Where is? from the Hamiltonian, OK, is there? OK. Where? You can imagine that uh, J12 is different from J21, but in that case, both this uh, value multiply the product of the choice of, the, of a woman in one group or another. And since that product is commutative, actually, at the end, if you start from something that is not symmetric, you, hand that you can take the, um, the semi sum of. Uh, of the two values. So for the computation, it's really simple to use a symmetric matrix. Yeah, and the second question is you said that you assume that enhancing the interactions is a cheap thing to do, and you actually assume the zero cost for that as part of the Yeah. You somehow speculate on how <coughs> it's possible to do that. Because uh, one idea could be. OK, if you know that is important interaction, actually here in this kind of model, we are assuming that all women are interacting with all the other women involved. This is not, comp it's not real life, but is a sort of medium effect, because usually you can interact in a very strong way with, for example, your mother, your best friend, and uh, your colleagues. And then you have this effect. So. <coughs> Now, the idea is, OK, uh, we know that interaction is important, so we could think to, to ask to a woman that participate to a campaign to share this fact with her, her friends. Or maybe to, I don't know, now it's so popular that when you do something on the web, you publish on your world in Facebook, oh, I did this. This could be a, an action without a cost, or with a small oh. cost. Is a cost, in, is, a, is a cost, I think yeah, it's a cost to explain to, that it is important to do this. Yes, but if you are really uh, aware of the importance of the test and you participate in the campaign, for you, the cost to explain is balanced to the, from the cost to, you know, help a friend of, a friend of you to do the, the good thing, the right thing. Oh, uh, yeah, what, what I mean, um, I was in, uh, in the US for a while and I, I was surprised that uh, when, when I was going out with friends, we were still of the same classes, economic classes. Actually, 
I, I came from a very small place in Italy and there it's very easy that I go out with people very rich, with people from completely different uh, you know, uh, level of instruction. But they are friends of mine, I trust them also if they are from different uh, situation with respect to me. So, why not? Excuse me? I, 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 didn't I, I think that interaction between different age classes are, are much more important. Than yes, sure. So maybe you would get very different results. If oh, this is, this is. This is possible. It will be very interesting to have a data set where also this information are present. Maybe, you know, this, uh, this data were not collected with the purpose specifically to, uh, to make this, uh, this work. So they, reach, they collect the, the information that were important for the health uh, system. But actually, you at the end can think, okay, I think that economic classes are relevant, so maybe could you, when somebody, when you plan the new campaign, ask also for this information in order to see if... Okay. Basically, uh, I, I don't get the intuition of how you go from the fact that these are not random fluctuations to the fact that it, they have to be fitted in that way. Exactly, I mean, can you imagine other mechanisms that would make the data non random, I don't know, the season or whatever? I mean, there can, there can be in principle many reasons why the data do not appear to be uh, random, other than, okay, if you use a model with many parameters, we always manage to fit the model. So, I mean, I, I, I didn't catch the link between the data and the, the reason why it's. Okay. Well, no. Oh, I move in the right <laughs> direction. So we have seen, or here actually is difficult to, it's not so easy to see because the picture is very small. But actually, um, we need to, to consider that so in some way there is something that, that causes this strange, this fluctuation in the data. And uh, because if we use a sort of model of like the McFadden one, we cannot reproduce this, this kind of fluctuation. And given the, um, the idea of the maximum entropy, we decide to use this interacting model. I don't know if I answer. There is nothing directly in the data that leads to the peer-to-peer effects in correlation to what <coughs> Well, we, we compute from the data the, the correlation among this group because the, the matrix J that we obtain can be computed from the average value and fluctuation and correlation of this data are, are con connected to them. Is not of the time. We actually tried also uh, in order to understand the, the robustness of our division in class to, to create three classes putting inside at random uh, women and then we compute the matrix and uh, we cannot obtain this, this, uh, this shape. And we, in this case, our matrix has this very high value on the diagonal and very small outside. Instead, when you mix it up everything, you obtain similar values everywhere. We tried also to move uh, 
to, to fix some classes and then you know, split one in order to, and also in that case, the results were not significant. So at the end, this is the reason why we decide that, that this was the, <coughs> the best option for this data. <coughs> 